Greg Peterson to come over for just a moment uh, and give John a, a good introduction here because Greg's in charge of a great uh, afternoon program uh, of, with Robert Jackson, the theme, our great native son. Greg, uh, introduce this gentleman. Sure, I'm thrilled to have John Q. Baird, a professor of law at St. John's uh, Law School, join us this afternoon at Chautauqua at the Hall of Philosophy to talk about Robert Jackson. Uh, John's a real scholar. Uh, you'll learn more about his background uh, today. But I'm thrilled that he's not only taken an interest in Robert Jackson, who is our local hero, made good, uh, but is also uh, it's a support of the Robert Jackson Center, which is a project which I know Jim, you and I have talked about and our community is real excited about as it's progressing. So to have John in our presence to be at this wonderful location at Chautauqua and certainly in front of that wonderful audience, uh, we're really looking forward to it. Thank you very much for that introduction, John. Welcome to Chautauqua. Thank you, Jim. It's great to be here. Well, we're, we know we're all excited. Uh, we talked earlier about the great contribution Carl Kappa made for the museum well, at, the, uh, temp at the Scottish Rite building on 4th and Prendergast. We're looking forward to the completion. That's right. Mr. Kappa's generosity and, and other benefactors and the hard work of Greg Peterson and many citizens of Jamestown have have come together in the in the building and in the ideas and ultimately in the programs that will be the Robert Jackson Center. You know, the one question that keeps coming up, because he's our native son and we, you know, we're proud, uh, has he gotten his due, uh, I mean, has he gotten the, the, uh, the credit or what we would call the notoriety that the job he did at Nuremberg? I think Jackson has his due in professional circles. He, he gets his due in students of the American Supreme Court and constitutional history. Uh, he gets his due in international law circles for his work as the American prosecutor as Nuremberg, at Nuremberg. Uh, he's just starting to get his due. I think the Jackson Center is part of his due to the, in the eyes of the general American public. Um, he's, uh, he's been gone since 1954. And in an interesting way, I think he's a, he's a growth stock. There are great things about this man that become more apparent the further his life recedes into the past, because he really did some things of lasting significance. If I can't remember who I should give credit to, but I remember somebody using quotes from Robert Jackson. Robert Jackson's words sing. He was a beautiful writer. He was a skilled orator. He did all his own work. And so uh, from aphorisms to extended passages, essays, Supreme Court opinions, Nuremberg speeches, uh, the words do live on. That's part of the power. Do you have a favorite? Um, I have a favorite phrase, uh, which I'll steal a little bit from this afternoon. Uh, in his Nuremberg opening statement, he said that four great powers flushed with victory in this proceeding using law rather than vengeance to deal with the vanquished powers is the greatest tribute that power has paid to reason. And I think power being restrained by reason is really a, a thematic summary of his life. Uh, so that's, that's one line among many. Uh, and you're going to give more of those in your talk I, this afternoon. I will touch on, on a few of those. At 3.30 yeah. in the Hall of Philosophy. That's right. Why did, you, uh, why did you go into research for Robert Jackson? I got interested in Jackson first as a law student and then as a lawyer. I was a federal prosecutor because of the quality of his words, his Supreme Court opinions, his career, his uh, example was interesting in the sort of law world. And then as I began to be a law professor teaching prosecutorial ethics, legal ethics, and constitutional law, I kept running into Robert Jackson as a, a major thinker and writer and figure in those worlds, and uh, started to research, realized that there wasn't nearly enough writing that has been done about the man, and uh, dove in myself. Bester Plaza Studio, uh, if, if, you know, in baseball they call somebody a pinch hitter, right? That's right. And let me put it this way, when a manager calls on a pinch hitter, they say, you know, you're the man that should be on the spot in this particular situation. John Barrett, you're a pinch hitter. You're the man on the spot. I'll try uh, to put my bat <laughs> on the ball. <laughs> no, you're called on because you can, you can fulfill the obligation I've put you in. Okay. In, uh, it's in an honor of. to be here. I'm well, listen, well, welcome. Let me, uh, uh, let me go further into Robert Jackson because you gave such a wonderful quote, one of your favorites. Uh, the, the movie that came out, Yep. on TNT, I think it was. Am That's I right? right? It was last summer starring Alec Baldwin as Justin right. Jackson. What, uh, what was your review of that? It was generally a commendable effort, uh, particularly the courtroom scenes 
were very true to the historical record and very powerful in presenting the Nuremberg trial. Um, and I applaud the effort since I'm engaged in my own efforts to bring Justice Jackson to uh, an ever-growing audience. Uh, there were aspects of the movie that were a little bit uh, a little bit short of the mark on some of the history questions, but I think those were in the details. And but did did Hollywood do its usual, you know, little frosting here it, and there? It buffed here and polished there. It inserted a little romance that <laughs> wasn't true to the historical record. Uh, but uh, in general, the point of Nuremberg is the trial that Jackson was the architect uh, who designed and the prosecutor who conducted, and the movie did a good job with that. Let me ask this question. They're hoping to bring Milosevic in front of that's right. That he is now tribunal, in, right? He is now in custody in the Hague and uh, and charged with very serious crimes. Will they look back and and take you know as a, a wonderful case the Nuremberg trial to conduct this one? Yes, uh, the special tribunal that's been created to deal with the former Yugoslavia and a a a sister proceeding that is dealing with the atrocities in Rwanda are directly on the model of the International Military Tribunal that existed at Nuremberg. There's also a treaty that's being ratified by a growing number of nations, and uh, when the number reaches 60, an international criminal court, a permanent court, as opposed to an event-specific tribunal like Nuremberg or Yugoslavia or Rwanda, will come into effect. And all of those things follow in the path that Robert Jackson began in 1945. John Barrett, you said, interestingly, in that quote, you know, it wasn't vengeance that Robert Jackson was after. It was the law. That's right. Robert Jackson... The law coming down on criminals and using the law, not trying to use an emotional, you know, vengeful attitude. That's right. Um, I think Jackson was concerned at Nuremberg to do justice in the circumstances, and he also very much had his eye on history and the precedent that was being created by the efforts not just of himself and the United States, but of the four nations, really the international community, bringing shared standards to bear through a legal process on captured criminals who were also vanquished adversaries in a war context. With John Barrett on Robert Jackson. He speaks this afternoon, 3.30, in the Hall of Philosophy. We'll be back. Uh, Greg, uh, I know that you want to certainly uh, uh, say a few words regarding the tremendous work that was put in by Dr. Daniel Bratton regarding the Robert Jackson Museum. Yeah, I, I, I was remiss not earlier talking about the energy that was provided by uh, Dr. Bratton. Very early on, he, and, and shortly after his retirement, I had an opportunity to spend some time with him and asking him what he was doing. He was retired, looking forward to going to Arizona. Uh, I inquired about whether or not he would find an interest in helping us on this Robert Jackson. He was somewhat reluctant. Uh, went over to the consistory, walked around, listened to uh, Betty and Carl talk about it. Next thing you know, he was off and running. Uh, he went down to Washington, spent time with Justice O'Connor uh, on our behalf, and Justice O'Connor and he collectively opened up doors at the Library of Congress, the Supreme Court Historical Society. Our appearance today was a direct result of Dan's uh, encouragement that we become part of the Chautauqua uh, area, and also he had a vision of what the potential collaboration could be between Chautauqua as an outreach to our community and the Robert Jackson Center, and wrote on it, spoke about it. Unfortunately, he was diagnosed uh, fairly early on with a pancreatic cancer, but even afterwards, even after he was diagnosed, uh, he indicated that he would continue on uh, working to the extent possible, did so. Uh, and in fact, in his diary that he kept, uh, mentioned the fact that the Jackson Center uh, throughout so he was really focused, and he gave us that uh, instant credibility, that instant energy, the vision, the statement, and mission that he provided to Chautauqua for 16 years. We were blessed to have him for that very short period of time, but uh, his legacy will live on through the Robert Jackson Center. Thank you very much, Greg. Fine words in behalf of a fine gentleman and a great president here for 16 years. Exactly. So it'll be carried on forever now in the Robert Jackson Museum. Exactly. John Barrett, uh, just a couple of, of more thoughts here. Uh, you're, 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 you're a young man. I'm 40. That's young. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope so. <laughs> uh, was this a personal journey of, of your of sorts, or were you a sci I mean, was there some commitment here in some way? No, I've just developed this as an interest as I was teaching, and, and it, seems, um, it seems like a, 
a good place to spend a lot of energy. You, you want to pursue a worthy project, and, and frankly, you want to have good heroes. Uh, somebody once said, if you pick your heroes carefully, you don't need many. This and is the, I think the, I found a very good one in this, in this man, in this project. What a nice word to put into our discussion, because this is the phenomena of heroism week. It's a good week to be here. And there is a hero out there. Absolutely. Robert Jackson. Did you research our local coverage of his funeral? I have seen uh, the newspapers from the time, and I've actually seen a film clip that, that Greg, through his incredible energy, unearthed um, that shows the, the eight surviving Supreme Court justices as they're getting off the train in Jamestown. I think it's, it's maybe the only time, and certainly the last time, that the full Supreme Court has traveled as a, as a group, as a, as a family, uh, to bury one of its own. Jackson's actually the last Supreme Court justice to have died in active service. Uh, he died suddenly, and he was only 62 years old. And they all came up not only to the... There was a big funeral at the National Cathedral in Washington. They then traveled by train to Jamestown, where there was a funeral at St. Luke's Church. They then traveled to Frewsburg, where he is buried in a very small and, and beautiful cemetery nestled in the hillside, uh, right around the corner from the house he grew up in. And uh, the eight justices, Chief Justice Warren and, and the other seven, uh, were there in 1954 for all of that. And that's what awaits everybody as far as, uh, we'll say, the, the tourists who want to come and see something very special. Uh, here we are, Jamestown, the only one that gets to say, you know, the entire Supreme Court came here for that funeral. And uh, I have, again, we talked about it with Helen and Harold and uh, uh, with Charlie, I should say, uh, who was in charge of the committee welcoming the Supreme Court justices. And I, I can recall saying they were met at the train station. They were immediately journeyed to Moonbrook. They didn't play a round of golf, though. Okay, I, th I think that was just the luncheon. <laughs> that was just the luncheon there. <laughs> Maybe they didn't have time. They might have enjoyed playing nine holes. I think that's right. But, Sean, thank you so much. And I'm, I'm sure the audience will await everything you have to say this afternoon. Thank you, Jim. It's a real privilege to be here. Greg, thanks a million. Thank you, Jim. Greg Peterson.